What's up, everybody? We're doing more Malifaux lore, and this week, the master that we're talking about is going to be Maxine of the Explorer Society. So spoilers coming up for all of Maxine's stories, and you can find a list of those stories in the description below in case you want to check them out yourself. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, or the Burning Man will come for you next. And with that done, let's jump into Maxine. Maxine is one of the most trusted members of the scientific community. She grew up as a member of a rich mining family and was poised to become a member of the social elite before she took to her studies and decided to pursue an academic career. Her father disapproved until she helped invent an early form of the battery, causing the demand for copper to skyrocket and boosting profits at the family mine. She went on to earn several PhDs and master's degrees, and her career saw her traveling the world, where she recruited different people to her team. Her father gifted her a ship that she called the Exploration Vessel Superior, and that team became her crew. When the Burning Man arrived on Earth, it threw everything into chaos as governments tried to deal with the gibbering hordes and the cult of the Burning Man. Maxine turned her attention to the portals that appeared, and though she didn't get her hopes up, she felt certain that she could discover how they worked. Maxine is in her office studying the portals as her husband Orville sits behind her, playing with a paper airplane. Her eyes wander away from her work, and she notices her copy of The Flamme, a book written by a follower of the Burning Man that possesses magical power and corrupts people, turning them into members of the cult. Her copy is heavily edited as she paid people to transcribe the work, taking out all the religious dogma in hopes of reducing its influence on the reader. Orville cautions her not to look too closely at the crazy man's book, and Maxine says that she can't make any sense of the portals, so he suggests that they talk it out. She explains that the portals need tremendous power to sustain themselves, even more power than many people could create with a steady supply of soul stones. She goes on to explain that the unusual thing is that energies normally dissipate as the ley lines form and then scatter. She compares the natural etheric energies of the planet to electricity, but she can't make any sense of where it seems to flow. Orville notices how tired Maxine looks, but knows better than to try to stop her when she has her mind stuck on a scientific problem. He tells her that dinner is waiting, and when she shows no sign of joining him, he tells her he will save her a plate. After he leaves, she stares at the fumé until she suddenly has a breakthrough. She scribbles frantically on a chalkboard, and then yells out to her husband. Orville returns, and she asks him to read the formula and tell her if it makes any sense. After considering it for a moment, he looks at her and smiles, asking if he should tell Kia to ready the superior. A week later, Maxine is on her ship, and she gathers her crew, telling them that she owes them an explanation for why she's dragged them out here. She explains that this is about the portals that have been plaguing Earth, and then opens a map which shows the location of the most recent portal openings, and explains that she thinks that she knows that a portal should open at their location off the coast of Greenland next. Kia, her Abyssinian engineer, is surprised and notes that if they can predict the portals, they could have Earth's militaries mobilize in order to contain the cult attacks before they get started. Bibi, the newest member of the crew, points out that they could also use this information to try to stem the tide of invaders from Malifaux, known as the Gibbering Hordes. Ia asks how Maxine figured this out, as even her people from Abyssinia, who are very scientifically and technologically advanced, don't have this kind of knowledge. Maxine sheepishly admits that she worked out the problem by carefully studying the Flamme. Everyone is shocked as she pulls out her copy of the book, and she explains that she has been very careful, and her copy of the book has pages missing and passages crossed out, which leaves very little cognitive risk. There is a brief silence before Harada Nagatoro says that he trusts her, and the others nod in agreement. Kia asks about their escort, referring to the two guild destroyers that have followed them on their journey, and Maxine explains that the expedition needed funding, and that the guild all but insisted on being involved when they found out what she was doing. Doing. The next day, Maxine sees Bibi preparing Calypso, a research submersible, and he explains that he has developed a console to pilot the machine remotely. They lower Calypso into the water, and everyone gathers around the console as Bibi checks the readings. He notes that everything is normal, except that there are signs of muscle tissue in the water. Maxine points out that it could be sharks or gibbering hordes, and then orders Kia to make sure everyone is alert and armed. She then tells Bibi to keep an eye out for any unusual readings that may indicate a portal opening. After four days, they still have no results. Maxine discusses the fuel and ration situation with Kia and determines that they can go for another two to three weeks before needing to return to port. She checks with Bibi as he launches Calypso again, and he reports that nothing has changed. Then a red light starts blinking on the control console, and he explains that it means Calypso is trying to return to the surface, but he's not sure why. The ethercom in the room rings, and Harada tells Maxine that it's here. When she asks for clarification, he just says that they have to leave this place, and suddenly the ship shudders, and an alarm 
alarm starts going off. Maxine calls the bridge, and Kia reports that there's turbulence, but she's not sure what's causing it. Bibi reports that there's been a spike in the water temperature, and he manipulates Calypso until it faces downward, revealing an orange gash under the water, where a portal is beginning to open. It starts pulling Calypso towards it, and Maxine tells him to pull the machine back up as she runs towards the bridge. She gives the order to maneuver away from the portal, and the ship starts listing to the side as they see a maelstrom forming as water is pulled into the portal. Suddenly, the portal reverses, shooting out a geyser and pushing the EVS away. Before they can react, the ship impacts one of the guild destroyers, and they receive reports that they're taking on water. They see the other guild destroyer get sucked towards the maelstrom, and the tidal forces pull the ship apart, and explosions go off as it sinks. Shortly after, the other ship gets pulled down into the portal and disappears. As the EVS starts getting sucked in too, everything goes dark, and Maxine is not sure if she's still standing on the ship. She sees images of horrible deformed bodies and alien-looking creatures across many different worlds, and above all of them, she sees a burning man. Suddenly, the ship surfaces, and water washes over the deck. Everyone struggles to their feet, and Maxine notices that one of her arms is broken. She asks Kia for a damage report, and the woman tells her that the engines are down, and she turns to her husband and asks if he saw those things while they were in the portal. Orville is confused and asks what she means, as he only saw darkness before they appeared here. This triggers Maxine to consider where here is, and she and Orville look outside, and he points out that there are two moons, just like in Malifo. Kia orders Bibi to take a look at the engines, and she then looks through binoculars and tells Maxine that the other guild ship made it through as well. She sees sailors on the deck using signal flags to inform them that they their engines are also down. Harada approaches and asks Maxine if she saw them too, and the woman realizes that Orville does not have any magical ability, but Harada is a powerful mage. She wonders if that's the explanation for her visions, but then notes that they'll have to discuss it at another time. The ship shakes again, and they look outside to see an enormous sea creature, resembling a cross between a crab and an eel, rise up out of the ocean and approach the guild ship. They hear gunfire, and the crew starts to panic as the monster tears into the ship, and it starts taking on water. Once it's clear that the guild ship is not going to make it, Maxine considers whether they should go help, but then realizes that if a guild destroyer can't stand against it, then they don't stand a chance. Maxine and Kia order the crew to get the ship running at all costs so that they can leave, and Maxine asks Harada if he can sense the creature. He explains that it is more powerful than anything he's ever encountered, and that even in Malifo, where his magic is more powerful, he does not think he can stand up to it. The guild ship goes under, as the power the superior flickers back on, and the creature immediately turns its attention to them. Maxine orders them to turn off all the lights and silence anything making noise, so they can try not to attract its attention. The engine fires up, and they try to make their escape, but Bibi reports that they will not be able to make good speed, with the engines damaged as they are. Kia suggests that they stand and fight, and Orville offers to fly out and drop explosives onto the creature to distract it. Everyone acknowledges that this probably won't have any effect, but Maxine likes the idea of a distraction, and tells him to drop the explosives further away, so that the creature might go to investigate. The man flies off in his jetpack, and they all head to the deck where Calypso sits. Maxine asks Bibi to rewire their submersible to emit a loud signal that they might be able to use to lure the creature in. She asks Kia to strip the electric coils out of the harpoon guns on the deck of the ship and load them into the machine. They hear explosives go off as Orville tries to lure the creature away, and it is momentarily distracted, but then continues its pursuit of the ship. Orville soon returns and reports that the creature got wise to his game as Kia emerges from Calypso and reports that their makeshift mind is ready. Harada crouches down and channels his energy to raise the ocean water up, capturing Calypso and pulling it into the sea. He swings his fists, and waves rise up to push Calypso forward. They watch in silence as it gets further away, and then they see the creature veer off to go after it. Maxine orders the crew to do everything they can to get as far away as possible as the creature lashes at Calypso, and the field of electricity around it sparks, keeping the creature at bay. After two weeks, the crew is getting desperate, and they are not sure if they are even headed in the right direction. As Maxine is discussing their predicament, Harada summons her to the deck and points to the sky. They see a small black dot, which slowly grows, until they recognize it as an airship. When it gets close enough, they dock, and a well-dressed man descends to the superior. He introduces himself as Nagatoro, and Maxine asks him how they found her. The man looks at Harada and said blood calls to blood, and the two men greet each other coldly in their language. The man explains that his employers did not want all of the knowledge on this vessel, lost, and that he'll be taking them back to Malifo City. She orders her people to prepare to leave, and then approaches Harada, asking if the man is his father. He says they are blood and nothing more. She asks why he doesn't seem to trust the man, considering that he came all this way to save them. And Harada responds, did he? 
After the EVS and crew arrived in Malifaux, Maxine garnered a lot of attention. She began working with the Explorer Society, whose leaders were eager to get their hands on some of the grant money Maxine had coming in. They built an oceanic research station on the coast and refitted the EVS, but Maxine felt that something was wrong. Maxine started noticing that something was off, and the portals weren't always matching her calculations. She starts becoming more obsessive in her research, hiding herself away for weeks at a time to try to solve these new mysteries. English Ivan makes his way through the bayou to Maxine's research station. He is found by Kia, who is suspicious of the man, but points him in the direction of Maxine's office. On his way inside, he bumps into Orville, and they greet each other warmly, before Ivan asks where Maxine is. Orville explains that she's in her office, but that he might have a hard time speaking with her. He knocks on her door, and announces that they have company, but Maxine tries to shoo them away, insisting that she has work to do. When Orville insists, she comes to the door, and both of them notice how exhausted she looks. Orville suggests that they all go have dinner, and as they make their way down the hall, English Ivan's shadow, Mr. Mordrake, splits off from him and heads back towards the office. When he enters her office, he takes in the chaos as scientific instruments and notebooks lay scattered around the room. He begins investigating, and while the equations and formulas are meaningless to him, he can sense their magical power. He finds a chalkboard, as well as a small book sitting on a shelf next to it, the Flamme, and then he reads the words on the chalkboard that say, Breach, 5 or 6 p.m. In the mess hall, Maxine is staring out the window as Ivan watches her suspiciously. He asks what's going on, and Orville tries to deflect, before conceding and asking Maxine what's been bothering her. She sighs and gives in, explaining to the men that her predictions have been wrong this whole time. Orville insists that that can't be possible, because without her predictions, they couldn't have made it to Malifaux. Maxine clarifies that she was really half wrong, as she didn't fully understand the portals, and hadn't considered that they could be simultaneously open on one end and closed on the other. And in addition, they could be open on Earth at one time, and open in Malifaux at a different time. Orville has a sudden realization, and the two discuss the mathematics, as Ivan listens in without understanding. Maxine explains that for some reason, since their arrival, the appearance of the portals has gotten more and more erratic. Mr. Mordrake returns to English Ivan and drops a note in his pocket and he reads it and his eyes go wide. As Maxine stares out the window, suddenly red light starts pouring in from the sky and English Ivan checks his watch, 547. As panic spreads, they make their way outside and see that the sky is the color of magma and flames and ash are pouring down. Tia and Harada join them and beg Maxine to tell them what's going on, but the woman doesn't seem to notice them as she looks up at the sky and states that he's here. They all ask what she means, and Kia points out that her people have seen this before, always just before the outbreak of madness. Maxine responds that this isn't madness, as she predicted it. They all ask what she means, and her only reply is that she found order in the chaos, and she suddenly passes out. So that's Maxine's story so far. Quite the cliffhanger there. I'm really eager to know if she actually understands what the Burning Man is and does, and if she's just trying to figure out the science, or if she already has some more sinister motivation. It'll be really cool to see what happens after this, and if she's going to be permanently influenced by the Burning Man, or if they'll all find a way to push off his influence. Either way, it seems like a lot of things are going to change around Malifaux, and I'm really excited to see where it's going. I'm curious what you guys think. Post a comment and let me know. Do you think these eight masters will be influenced by the Burning Man long term? Or do you think the end of this story arc will be them somehow defeating the Burning Man? And Maxine, Euripides and Misaki all going back to normal. I'd like to know what you guys think. But anyway, drop me another comment. And let me know what master you want to see me do a video on next. I think first I'll finish out the masters from Malifaux Burns that I haven't covered yet. So Riva and Ulix. But let me know who you want to see after that. While you're down there, don't forget to give me a like and subscribe to the channel. And thanks for watching.